Okay, um, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, this is the exploratory online seminar number 86. Uh, this time, I like to introduce Kraskar Wallis test. Uh, this is really about like, a, you know, this is actually the part of the hypothesis testing series. Uh, we have done the introduction of the hypothesis test and then also the t-test and chi-square test and so on. Today, I like to focus on this thing cross, uh, called classical Wallis test. It is about testing the difference in variance with no assumption. Before getting into, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Kan Nishida, a CEO at Exploratory. Uh, we started Exploratory back in 2016 to democratize data science by building a tool called Exploratory, making easier to access various data science methods to understand um, your own data. Um, also, we provide this type of seminar or training to uh, share our knowledge and skills. So uh, that way with the knowledge and the skills and also the tools uh, with the sort of like both wheels of the vehicle to push forward to democratize data science. Our vision is data informed decisions making is the key to make the world better. Uh, therefore, we want to, and we like to democratize data science. When we talk about data science, when we uh, discuss about data science, we think in, uh, in this sort of like workflow term, you have the business questions you wanna answer. So you want to access the data, you wanna transform or clean the data so that you can visualize or analyze. Once you find useful insights, then you wanna communicate with others because most of the time you don't work by yourself, you work with a team or with the stakeholders and so on. Exploratory provides a modern and simple UI to do these five pillars of the data science, data access, data wrangling, visualization, analytics, and communication. Okay, enough about myself and Exploratory. Let's get into today's uh, core part of uh, the seminar, which is a classical words test, uh, testing a difference in variance with no assumption. As I said at the beginning, this is a part of the hypothesis testing series. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, episodes in the last few weeks. <clears throat> you can access to the past recording from our website, go to the exploratory.io, and then under the learn menu, there's a training and seminar. And then when you go to that online seminar page, and then you can click on the past recording link, then you will see something like this. Um, then you can check, especially the introduction to hypothesis testing, uh, seminar number 83. This is the seminar where I set the grand sort of like a frame, a, pro, a sort of foundation for how to think about hypothesis testing. Because in hypothesis testing, in a statistics world, there are a lot, uh, there are not a lot, but there are many um, special terms um, that you don't really hear often in the real world. And also the way to think about in that hypothesis testing framework, which is kind of weird at the first sight. However, when you think through it, they actually it you kind of do, you know, you know, even like the daily life, but it's kind of like how to make that connection. So I actually explained that in that particular seminar called Introduction to Hypothesis Testing. And I'm going to actually use that uh, sort of like, uh, I'm going to talk, discuss about today's topic based on that foundation. So if you haven't, I strongly recommend to watch that uh, seminar. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so that this hypothesis testing is really about is that difference when you see the difference or some kind of association relationship between the uh, you know uh, two variables. The question is: Is this difference significant? And then, like, if your um, <clears throat> target variable or the variable of interest, let's say you're thinking of, you're uh, looking at the sales or conversion or whatever. The uh, interest of uh, whatever the uh, interest of yours, then the next question is like, uh, what makes a difference, right? So like, you always want to sort of like find out that relationship. But when you see the relationship, it's really what you're looking at is a difference. Um, then the difference is significant or not. If the target variable is a numerical, like sales or salary or um, number of the, uh, something, then like you want to go to uh, 
T test, ANOVA, Wilcoxon, classical worries, left hand side. If it's categorical, then chi square test. Okay. But today, I like to focus on this classical worries test. Okay. There's a sorry, uh, there's a typo here. It's uh, supposed to be, I think this is a K. Um, there you go. Okay. So um, we, here the agenda, I, I'm going to introduce a classical words test at a very brief. And then uh, next one, the assumption for T test and ANOVA. This is really kind of like a setting up the kind of like a, um, sort of like a, what do you say, like motivation why you want to actually use classical words test rather than T test and ANOVA. And then I'm going to touch a little sort of like a you know, quick summary of thinking framework for hypothesis testing. This is the one that I said uh, I have done the introduction of to the hypothesis testing. In that seminar, like I spent 50 minutes, 55 minutes to talk about the whole thinking framework thing. But uh, I'm going to just kind of refresh that, you know, the framework quickly. And then the next one, the logic behind classical words test. This is a big part of the, today's seminar. This is where I go into sort of like uh, logic or uh, the, how you actually, how the classical words test works. So it gets a little bit of um, uh, complicated. Uh, there's some kind of like, uh, formula getting involved. I try not to show you the formula that, you know, like you, you see often in a statistics um, seminar and classes, um, but still there are some multiplication, the division kind of stuff. So, but anyway, so this is actually, it's really um, useful, I think, to know how the cross category test works. Then you can see actually a similarity among other uh, hypothesis testing. And then that kind of help you to understand how the whole hypothesis testing or what the mean of like evaluating the difference is significant or not. Okay, and then at the end is I'm gonna use exploratory to run the cross category test. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Our cross card worries test is to test if two or more groups are coming from the same distribution. Um, that's the kind of official way of uh, explaining what the cross card worries test, but it's really is that we want to evaluate if the relationship between a numerical variable and a categorical variable is significant or something that is worth our attention, okay? Um, another word, like we want to make sure whatever the difference we are looking at between these two variables is something that we should pay more attention or maybe not that important, then we should move on, right? So like we want to make that decision. So what that mean by the two variables? Here is one is numerical variable. Uh, let's say that we have like uh, HR data or employee data. And then we have like income information or salary information. And also we have the gender of each employee information. Okay. And then the gender is a categorical and the income is a numerical. Then when you typically like draw the chart like this, uh, this is showing the mean income by gender. Male, $6,700. This is like a monthly income. And then the female is $5,800. Okay. And then like we want to uh, evaluate this difference that we are seeing right now, right here, is significant that we should pay attention to. Okay, how about two, more than two groups? <clears throat> Classical worries tests can take care of that too. It doesn't have to be only two. The difference between two groups, it can be uh, the difference among multiple groups. So let's say like we have the income and another variable, categorical variable, is the job role, and then. Uh, if you draw the bar, uh, bar chart, it you know becomes like this. And this is like, again, mean income, but this time by job role, sales, human resources, HR, and research and development, and R&D. Okay. And then classical words test uh, can be used to see if this difference uh, is significant or not. But how about T-test and ANOVA? Okay, so for example, the first case, the income and then the gender, okay? And then why, why can't we use T-test? Because this case happened to have only male and female. That's the two values, right? Then in that case, it's perfect for T-test. Focus on the difference between these two means, 
Um, so it's like nine hundred dollars difference. And if this nine hundred dollars difference is significant, or we should pay attention to. Another case is we have the job roles. We happen to have like three. Then you know, like TTS cannot handle it because TTS is always focusing on the difference between the two means. But we can use ANOVA, which is based on the variance, and then we can see, uh, we can test if the difference in variance among these groups is significant or not. However, there's one problem. The both T-test and ANOVA test assumes that the underlying data is normally distributed. So, so let's look, look, uh, take a look at the assumption for T-test and ANOVA. In order to see it, I want to use a uh, T test as a sort of like example. Okay. So go back to that same chart. We have two means, one for the male, one for the other for the female. The difference is $900. Okay. So how we can say, say this $900 is, uh, you know, big enough difference or small enough to ignore, right? Then we want to look at the variance in the data. So for the male variance and the female variance, I'm going to kind of go up the very high level. I'm not going to go into this variance is actually the standard error or standard deviation, that, that kind of stuff. But it's just I'm going to use variance as a very brief, as a brief term. Okay. That's a variation, uh, so, so to say. Okay. Now, when you have the, I mean, the data varies, right? So it's not like everybody is on the same number, which is a mean value. So it's not, some people has a small number, some people has a big number. So the data varies. So based on how the variance in the data, then the way to treat this $900 difference will be different. For example, something like the variance is something like this in the male and the female, then, what do you think? This difference is uh, big enough or that's small enough? Okay, but let's use another example. It seems like this one is like smaller than the variance in male, variance in the female. So it's not, doesn't look like that big enough. But how about the case like this? This one is a $1,900 difference. And when you look at that uh, by bringing in the variance again, Okay, so data varies, right? So like this is a variance. So think of it as sort of like a, a mean difference from um, <clears throat> the the over, I mean, male mean and female mean or something, or like standard deviation, whatever the uh, familiar concept you can bring in. This, uh, this is very high level overall uh, thing. In a in precise way, it, this is supposed to be the standard error, but I'm not gonna go into that in this seminar. That if you, are, if you want to know more detail, Take a look at the introduction to T-test seminar in um, uh, recording. But anyway, so here, look, when you have this variance in male, variance in female, the difference, $1,900, is pretty big compared to the male variance and the female variance. So this case, we tend to sort of get, I think that there's a tendency for us to say, oh, this difference is a significant difference compared to the last example, previous example, that difference is compared to the variance in the data is kind of small. And it's really that this ratio or this relative ratio that actually plays a significant role in terms of like being able to say, this is a significant difference or not significant difference. And obviously <clears throat> that difference is relatively bigger than the variance in the data, then it tend to be able to say that difference is more, uh, it's significant. Okay. So now when you look at this one, like, uh, I've been kind of, you know, you're talking about this variance thing. So how that variance in the data, right? So when I'm going to switch, I'm going to just kind of transform this uh, sort of vertical view to horizontal view. Okay. So like this, bringing into on the horizontal uh, view. So left-hand side female, the right-hand side male, because males mean uh, income uh, income is higher than female in these slides, okay? So then 
we have this variance line. It's almost like, a, what is this line? This is like, um, you know, it's almost an error or confidence interval. What is it? But anyway, we don't have to go into that detail. It's just like a variance. So that, but that means we can draw some kind of like a distribution. So this is like a density chart. And then like, I just put like a normal distribution because we, I mean, not we, <laughs> it's uh, the p-test is about, you know, the uh, testing, that evaluating the difference against the variance in the data, and that is significant or not, right? So that means the difference is this green sort of like a arrow thing, right? And then that is because um the um, you know the variance or not. That when we say the variance, we uh, details is sort of like uh, assuming the data is distributed in a normal distribution. So for the female, the blue line, and uh, sorry. Male is blue line, female is red line, both of them um, assuming that data distribution looks like this. However, when you go to in an exploratory case and go to the chart view and then draw the chart, we've got something like this. And then not really normal distribution. It's like, um, you know, there are two peaks in the mountain for both male and female. Right, so uh, it's not really. So here, yeah, that is the problem. Like when you want to run a t-test or even like an over test, when you have more than two groups, then that they assume that underlying data is normally distributed, but that data is not. So then, what are we gonna do? Well, there is, there are other methods that can take care of in that type of situation, which is. Um, <clears throat> The Wilcoxon test for two groups, so it's kind of equivalent to T test or Kraskar Wallis test that is equivalent to ANOVA test. And then we call this type of uh, methods as non parametric, meaning it doesn't assume the underlying data distribution to be normally distributed. And then, the, I, like I said, this kind of like um, equivalent to ANOVA test. But however, this cross category test can be used in the replacement of the t-test as well. So it's not like a cross category test can handle only the category unique value uh, number of the categories greater than three and four and five and stuff. It can use to test only two categories like gender and the male or female case as well. Okay, so that says, going back to this matrix, it's almost like a classical Wallis test is like the um, Superman, right? It can it can be used for like two groups or multiple groups, or it can be used uh, regardless of the you know underlying data distribution. And then the answer is yes, it, it is basically Superman. Um, you know, some people can argue, um, <clears throat> you can argue that, well, that has that power of that, you know, uh, testing is more robust compared to, let's say, T test or ANOVA test or even like Wilcoxon test. And that can be arguable. Uh, based on like I have been seeing, it's almost like um, not much of a difference. Uh, meaning, it's basically if the data is normally as, uh, distributed. Then the small enough data, small. I mean, you know, let's say like we have only twenty rows or thirty rows kind of data. Maybe the T test and ANOVA test can uh, see the significance better than the cross category test. However, most of the time, most of us deal with you know big enough number of the data, so there is not much difference between T test and cross category and ANOVA in terms of the result. Um, so having said that, uh, cross color Wallis tests can be used for many various situations. Okay. So having said that, then the thinking framework for hypothesis testing, because I like to do this one before getting into logic behind cross color Wallis test. So when I talk about this hypothesis testing, I always bring in this picture, the deduction and the induction. These are the two way of thinking. The deduction is starting from the theory or assumption or hypothesis, whatever that could be, and then use the logic to conclude that you know something that you know you can explain the real world, or maybe even you can expect or predict something is going to happen 
based on that assumption. And that is a deductive thinking. As opposed to that right-hand side, inductive thinking or induction is start with observation. You look around, you experience in the real world, and then based on what you observe, you use the probability to estimate what is going to, um, what you can sort of like um, uh, uh, see, like what is going to happen. Um, also, the sort of like uh, you draw the generalized truth or theory. Okay, so basic, so it's a difference really is a deduction is sort of like start starting from your head, like you have your theory, whatever that could be. And then the conclusion, because that assumption is sort of like universal truth or even the world of mathematics, right? So it's like one plus one is two. That's like everybody agree on it. So from that, you know, like whatever you lead to is the, you know, like sort of like 100% sure, right? You can assume that. As opposed to that, the induction world is what you have observed is maybe like you might be not seeing something other than you have observed so far. So you never be really sure whatever the conclusion you lead uh, from the observation is the truth in the world. However, by using the probability, you can estimate that that is most likely true in the world. Okay, so deduction, induction. And then, but as great statistician uh, from UK, um, the George Box uh, proposed this thing called iterative learning process. Well, we don't use only one, like induction or deduction or either way. Instead, we actually use both to um, acquire the new knowledge by iterating, going back and forth. So the app top part is the data and facts or you know, whatever you observe in the real world. So induction, right? And eventually you def, uh, you estimate something that gener generalize truth or generalize some kind of theory. But then that's basically the same starting point of the deduction. So the deduction at the bottom is like a thinking. So like theory, hypothesis, model, assumption, whatever it could be, that's all in your head, all in our head. But then you can draw the conclusion from there then like you want to actually see what's happening in the world, check with the facts or data, and that's the induction. And going back and forth back. Okay. So it's a very simple example is where is my car? So you in you're in a parking lot and then you can't find your car. And what are you gonna do? So basically, like you your hypothesis or is hey, my car was stolen. Okay. And if, I mean put more precisely, like you actually let you know, reach this conclusion based on what you observe in the real world. So in a sense, like started from like induction. But besides that, like, so now like we have a hypothesis, my car was stolen. And what you can predict logically, uh, well, my car should not be in the parking lot if my car was stolen. Then you want to actually observe to test your hypothesis if it's true or not. And then like when you look around the parking lot, then my car happened, uh, turned out, was parked at a different spot in the same parking lot. And then this means my hypothesis and what I'm seeing, observe, are not consistent. These are inconsistent. So world of theory left hand side and the world of reality is not consistent. Therefore, we can reject the hypothesis left hand side top then we can conclude the right hand side top that my car was not stalled. However, if I could not find my car anywhere in the parking lot, the right hand side bottom, then in that case, the left hand side, world of theory, right hand side, world of reality, they are consistent. So therefore, we don't have to reject the hypothesis. We can accept the hypothesis. We sort of like, okay, maybe hypothesis, nothing wrong about this hypothesis. So therefore, our conclusion right-hand side top, we can, we're going to move on with my car was stolen. Okay. So that's the overall hypo, uh, sort of thinking framework. Then let's get into logic behind the classical words test. So let's go back to the original example. Income variable, which is numeric, and gender variable, which is categorical. 
are they related or independent from each other? That's the one, that's the thing that we want to uh, make a decision. So using the framework, the hypothesis testing framework, thinking framework, then left hand side, we start with hypothesis. And there is no relationship between income and gender. By the way, this is called neural hypothesis in this hypothesis testing framework. We need to start with neural hypothesis, meaning it's always there's no, there's zero, there's no relationship, that kind of stuff. Because otherwise we cannot falsify the hypothesis. As long as we have something like neural hypothesis, in this case, no relationship, then it's easier or it's even possible to falsify the hypothesis. That's why we use neural hypothesis. Then how, the, how to test if the relationship is significant by using the cross categories test. Well, these three steps, this is this internal uh, or like sort of a theory about the cross categories uh, framework, how it works. That doesn't mean we are going to do it by using pencil and papers or using exploratory and then create a calculation, that kind of stuff. This is just all down behind the scene, but, this, uh, but I like to introduce uh, sort of step by step, step by step. The key here is the ranking. Instead of using the original values, we're gonna use the rank values. Okay, so what that means. So we have something like this, male and female, and we know that there's a difference in terms of like um, maybe mean, right? Mean values. But uh, also this case, we actually focus on sort of like how the data values, okay? So are there any difference in terms of the variance between these two? Then what we're gonna do is, instead of using the one particular metric like mean, instead we're gonna use original values, right? So let's say this person, uh, for example, like male, right hand side, we have six people, female, we have uh, four people. And each of them are placed based on their income, okay? And then, how so starting point is like this and how we're going to uh, get that <clears throat> uh, classical words classical words test use a statistic number it's called h value so just like t test use t value chi square test use um chi square value anova use f value this is this here is we're going to use h value so it's really about how you calculate h value and based on if we uh, if h value is big enough that means it's significant it's small enough that means it's not significant so how are we going to calculate so assign the rank value to each employee remember so this is basically the whole purpose of a cross categories test is to use it in any circumstance of like any data distribution. So therefore, we want to get rid of the original values because that kind of get the distribution twisted. So instead, we ignore it. Even like when you have like a super crazy outlier values, we're going to assign that rank. Then it becomes sort of like kind of equal with, um, you know, a distance relationship. So in this case, uh, it doesn't matter male or female. So like all employee here, we have 10 people and then we assign a rank value from one to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay. And then we're going to use this rank values to calculate the age value. That's the key uh, statistic of this uh, class categories test. Okay. The cool thing about, or uh, I don't know, to me is uh, uh, it's kind of cool, but the thing about <clears throat> ranking is that left hand side we just assign the rank value, but the y axis scale is still the income original numbers. Now, if I change the y axis scale to be a rank starting from one to ten, then all those employee position will be changed. Right. And each sort of like distance among uh, from one to two, two to three, three to four, every distance becomes equal with equal distance. So let's take a look at the seven, employee seven, and employee eight. Left hand side, there are huge income difference, right? But then when you assign the rank and then 
use the ranking scale, then seven and eight, the difference between seven and eight is the same difference between a six and seven or eight and nine. And in this way, now like we, uh, this is sort of like uh, the reason that classical worries test can be used with any data distribution because it ignores almost like the original data distribution by assign a ranking and use the ranking for the later calculations. So now from here, we're gonna calculate a couple of things. What really we care is that like, we wanna see that basically, is there any difference between these two? And how are we gonna uh, evaluate the difference between these two groups, right? Blue group and then red group, right? So first we calculate the mean of the old data. Doesn't matter male or female in, the, in terms of, uh, all data, so it's let's call it rank mean, okay? And that happened to be 5.5. I mean, when you have one to 10, it's always a 5.5, right? And then now next one is a rank mean of male. In this case, we have employee number two, three, six, seven, nine, ten, And then add them up and then we have six people divided and then 6.17. That's the rank mean or mean of male based on the rank values. We're gonna do the same thing for female. Um, sorry about that. This is, um, oops, F female here. Um, we're gonna do the same thing for female and then happen to be 4.5, okay. Then what we want to do is that how much of the value, uh, sorry, how much of the difference between the means. So mean difference from like male rank mean minus the overall mean. And then we actually uh, <clears throat> add uh, what do you call it, the power to the our two. And then, uh, or square, right? And then like, yeah, we do the same thing for the female. So in this case, 4.5 minus 5.5, this becomes minus, but we're gonna square it. So it, both of them become, I mean, for sure, it becomes uh, not just positive, but also squared values. We actually use this square thing you know, all the time for this type of um, um, uh, calculation in, or find, evaluating a difference. It's just like standard deviation. But anyway, so the, here so far, we just square for that difference of each rank mean, okay, from that overall mean. And then male has six people, female has only four people. So how are we gonna basically, what we wanna do here is sort of like uh, calculate uh, way, uh, mean, diff, uh, mean rank mean, mean of rank mean. <laughs> so what we wanna do is that because the number of the people is different. So we're gonna apply the weight. And then, so we calculate the weighted mean of the rank mean difference. So divided by 10, but also six multiply 6.717 uh, minus 5.5 square plus four multiply 4.5 minus 5.5 square and divided by two, a uh, 10, 10 is a you know, number of the people. So what are we doing here is we really, what we are trying to do is how much of the difference are these making so like 6.17 and 4.5 these two values how much differ from the 5.5 and in the extreme case just think about like there's no difference male and female there's no difference in that case like when you start ranking it's probably going to be like male female male female one two three four five six seven eight Right, so there's like even number is the male, odd number or the female, something like that. Then when you calculate the mean rank for each group, then they will become something like 5.5, which is overall mean. Then that means there's not much um, dif uh, difference, right? So basically 5.5 uh, minus 5.5 and a square and a zero, 5.5 minus 5.5 and zero. So what we are trying to do is the difference like the blue arrows and the red arrows. And then we wanna actually calculate the sort of like a mean of these differences. Okay, so how far from the overall mean? That's what this one is really doing. And then just like the case of t-test, 
we want to calculate the variance in the in the data itself. It's very close to actually uh, more closer to uh, the thinking of ANOVA. <clears throat> so calculate the variance of all data, then it becomes something like this. Basically, you uh, calculate the difference of each rank value from the rank mean. And we do that for like each employee for like these 10 people. And then we divide by 10, then we can calculate the sort of like a mean of the difference from the overall mean, right? And that's called variance. If you, um, uh, anyway, if you make the apply the root, then it becomes a standard deviation, but I'm not gonna go in there. This is just a variance, okay? Then what we're gonna do is rank mean difference, left hand side that we calculated before and divide by rank variance. So basically like how much the mean is differ from the uh, main mean by separating to male, female compared against the variance in the data. So it's very similar to T-test or uh, ANOVA in terms of the way you, um, you know, evaluate the difference. Okay, so the this calculation right now is divided by, right? And from here is a little gets technical because this is a just division, but we wanna calculate. So like what we're gonna do is like, we can actually um, multiply like this, but when you do it, the rank variance size switch. So now at this point, you can actually kill this 10 on both sides. That means it becomes something like this. So the number of the, uh, people, 10 part uh, can be um, removed. And then basically what we have here is rank mean difference divided by rank variance. Again, what this really mean is something like this. So that again, what we care is how much that rank mean difference created by separating the data by to male and female, which is this green arrow, okay? And that is how big is this difference compared to the underlying variance in the data, which is the purple, okay? And then obviously, if the green is bigger and compared to purple, then the number becomes like one or two or three. But if the green is small and the purple is, you know, way bigger, then the number is going to be like zero point something, right? So that's the actually really, here's a, the ratio of the rank mean difference, the green against the rank variance, which is purple. Okay. And then you multiply number of employees. You wanna uh, now apply 10, but in this case, I think it's like a uh, 10 minus one. That's the classical Wallis test formula. And then you get this value 0 0.73. That's the H value, okay? But again, what we do really doing here is to calculate the ratio, like right? how big of that difference in terms of the rank values, but how much of the mean difference um, is big compared to uh, compared against the um, data variance. And then what we can we got this zero point seven three. Okay, we got number from male and female, and then assign the rank values and calculate the H value zero point seven three. So let's go back to the hypothesis framework, right? So left hand side bottom the conclusion deduction side of the conclusion is that H value rank mean difference ratio supposed to be zero because we based on the assumption that there's no relationship between income and gender. So there's, I mean, the H value should be zero. But we got this data and then that is data says that H value is 0 0.73. So it's not zero. But however, as you have known, the data has the variance, right? So even if we sample two groups from a same population, right? Let's say like we all male group or all female group or all like, you know, it's the same group or something. And then we take the samples randomly and create the two groups. And then we calculate the H value by applying the formula we went through. Then H value all, most likely it's not gonna be zero because there's always variance in the data. So for example, maybe like one first time, like we get like a 0 0.9 and then we sample again and then 0 0.4 and sample again, 0 
Okay, this is we are talking about. Let's say that we have like 500 employees, they are all male. And then we actually randomly sample and do that, uh, repeat it, that process. And every time like you calculate the H value, H value is always different, right? But that H value should follow this chi-square distribution or probability distribution. And it's kind of like a, a chi-square test, but it's the same this, uh, probability distribution, okay? But assuming that there's no difference. So like you, if we sample from the same group, like let's say like a male group or something, it should follow this uh, uh, some, uh, distribution. And that's the assuming that there's no difference among the groups, that's the uh, new hypothesis. So if we accept that, then the H value we calculate should go come somewhere in this distribution, okay? And then this chi-square distribution is based on, I um, mean, the shape can vary depending on the degree of freedom. And what the degree of freedom? In this case, pretty simple. The degree of freedom is calculated as number of groups minus one. So in this case, we have only two groups. So two minus one equal one. That means the chi distribution is gonna look like this. This is a one degree of freedom uh, chi-square distribution. Once we have this distribution, then we can say like, hey, you know, most likely like that, if we assume the new hypothesis, then the H value we calculate should reside in this 95% area. Should be maybe like, you know, it's a three point something, um, 3.7 or 3.8 area, zero to 3.7 area, okay. So now left-hand side bottom, instead of like assuming that the H value is zero, but also it might not be zero, but it should follow the chi-square distribution. It should reside somewhere in the chi-square distribution. Then we got uh, basically what is the H value. Again, just to refresh, it's like a 0 0.73. That's the H value we calculated. And then drop that on the chi-square distribution with the degree of uh, freedom one. Then it turned out if the H value is being 0.73 or larger, is 39% of the uh, probability or 39% of the chance. Okay. So 39%, almost like 40%. It can happen like 40%. So what does that mean? That's where the threshold comes in, right? So what if, how we decide, oh, that can happen or that's not gonna happen or how do it happen? So we got to uh, decide a significant level. Typically, you use 5%, 1%, 0.1%. Today, I like to, I mean, this whole series, I'm going to use 5%. Uh, so that means if the p-value is greater than 5%, then we can't reject. But if it's less than 5%, we can reject the new hypothesis. So that means this time, what we got is 40% of the p-values, so that the, the, the p-value is the chance of getting, in this particular case, h value, assuming the new hypothesis. What's the chance uh, of getting this value? Basically, this is saying like, well, you know, it's a like 40% chance like you get this value or larger value, okay? So don't worry about it. That's just um, sort of like, um, you know, assume. I mean, that's, you know, expected. You know, you don't have to make a big deal about it. So, because this is greater than the uh, 5% chance. So, it you know, can happen. So, that means right hand side bottom, the H value is 0 0.73. A chance of getting this value is about 40% or 39%, if we assume the neural hypothesis. Therefore, the world of theory and the world of reality is consistent. They're consistent. So, we don't have to reject the neural hypothesis. Instead, we're going to keep accepting the neural hypothesis, which is there is no relationship between income and gender. Okay, so how about more than two groups? We use a very simple case, the male and female, two groups. How about job role? We have more than two groups. So something like this, we have four groups now, uh, sales, agent, R and D, HR, and PR. And then the difference in the income variance is related to job role, or because job role is uh, you know income is different, right? So again, it's not about the mean particular value. We we're gonna look at that 
each value. So like I put like uh, all the employee on the, their income. Okay. And we have actually in this case, four employee for each group. Then again, this is the really the key part of this uh, non-parametric or this particular case, a classical Wallis test. We're gonna rank them from one to this time, we have all 16 people, so one to 16. And once we assign rank, and we're gonna use a uh, rank as a y-axis scale, right? And then do the same thing we did before. This is kind of like a reminder. So rank mean of all, we calculate that, that is 8.5. And then we're gonna calculate the rank mean of each group. First, sales, second, R&D, third, HR, fourth, PR. Okay, so now we got a four rank means for I mean, each group, right? And then we're gonna calculate the difference between the rank means. I mean, like each rank mean should be, <clears throat> and we wanna calculate the difference from the overall mean, okay? And then we divide by 10 to calculate, basically kind of like a, uh, uh, this is actually not 10, sorry. This is supposed to be, it's overall, so like it's supposed to be 16. And the same thing. Uh, next one is also here the 16 as well. But basically, uh, because we have 16 people. Okay. And in this case, rank variance. What is the variance in data? And then we calculate that. And then we do, you know, divide division and then calculate uh, in this way. Okay. And so 16 minus one, that is the number of the employee minus one multiply. And then basically the ratio of the rank mean difference against the rank variance. And it happened to be 9.64. And again, the shape of the chi-square distribution varies depend on the degree of freedom. In this case, we have four groups. So therefore the degree of freedom is three, four minus one. That's the calculation of the degree of freedom. So that means the chi-square distribution we're gonna use is this one because this is the one with a three degree of freedom. Yeah, and then we drop that 9.64H value on this distribution and then calculate the percentage of the area uh, of like, a, you know, the H value being 9.64 or greater. And it happened to be 2.2%. Okay, so what that means is going back to the framework, right-hand side, bottom, the H value is 964 a chance of getting this value is about 2.2% if we assume that the new hypothesis is true. And 2.2%, you remember, we set the threshold where uh, um, we decide it's significant or not significant. It's 2.2%, uh, no, sorry, 5%. In this case, less than 5%. So it's the same thing, right? Like when you have weather forecasting and somebody said it's gonna rain, uh, so it's not gonna rain, the, the chance of raining is 2.2%. And then it rain, then that means you think, you wonder like what kind of you know forecast they're doing. Maybe like the assumptions they use is wrong. But if the, um, they said a chance of raining at 20%, then it rain, then you still kind of like, yeah, 20%, that can happen, right? So that's that kind of threshold we're talking about here. So it's like less than 2.5%. Uh, that's basically like you're saying it's not going to happen, but it's happening. So therefore, world of theory left on side or the world of neural hypothesis and the world of reality, the world we observe actual data, is not consistent. So we reject the neural hypothesis. So that means right-hand side top, there is a significant relationship between income and in this case, um, sorry, Sorry for keep uh, fixing this, but this is like a job role. And here too, this is a job role. Okay, we are talking about job role here. Okay, so there is a significant relationship between income and job role. Okay, so that's the really the logic behind the classical worries test. So how are we gonna do uh, run in exploratory? 
Okay. So uh, you don't have to do that kind of calculation manually. You don't have to use Excel and do that calculation. You just go to the analytics view. Okay. And before actually going, here is the data. This is the employee data. Each row represents each employee. And we want to focus on particularly this time, this monthly income. And then also, let's say maybe like a gender, which is a female male. Um, or maybe like a job role here, we have like a, uh, about like nine unique values, okay? And then the monthly income, uh, for example, what is this? This is like a mean is uh, 600, uh, sorry, 6,503. But this time we don't care about the mean anymore because it's all about ranking, right? But anyway, so we go to the analytics and then what we want to do is go to statistical tests statistical test and under that there is a classical worries test oops and then the target variables is monthly income and then the explanatory variable is gender and then we're going to just run it and then we got eight statistics that's the h value i was talking about and then the chance of getting value is 0.088%. So let's say like this is like 0.09%. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, 0.09 or like 9%. Okay. So if we use the threshold, the p-value threshold is 5%, and this is bigger than 5%. So therefore, it can happen. So we don't, nothing wrong with assumption. We can keep going with our assumption. There seems to be there's some kind of difference when you go to the error bar. And there seems to be the difference between female and male. In this case, female's uh, mean uh, income is higher than male. But this difference, look, uh, look at this one. This is like a 606, uh, sorry, 6,600 versus 6,300, so it's almost a $300 difference. And that is no significant difference. That's what this one is saying. And therefore, we can't reject the new hypothesis. And so, uh, so this is not significant, okay? But how about, here's a repeat by, there's a nine job roles, sales, R&D, and a manager, and so on. How about like we run this test for each job role for like nine groups? And then what happened? Like maybe like some group might have the significant difference. Let's find out. So you can actually go here in job role. And what this is going to do is separate, split the data into those nine sort of like uh, <clears throat> uh, groups, like based on the job role. And then we run, it runs the classical words test for each group. And I'm gonna just sort by the p-value and then I could look at that here is the smallest fee value is 0.01, which means 1% or 1.4% for the research director. Next one, the manager is 16%. So if we use, again, the threshold of 5%, then only the research director is actually less than the 5%. And what that mean? Well, that means that difference, this H statistics, or more simple word is a difference suppose not happen, but however, 1% of the chance, 1.4% of the chance of getting a statistic this big, uh, you know, can happen, but it's happening. So the assumption has to be rejected. Therefore, we can say research director, there's a difference between gen, uh, the male and the female in terms of monthly income. Okay. And then when you go to the error bar, and then you can see this is the underlying data. And then research uh, director is here. So I'm gonna just focus on here. And then even with this like a mean different, but also that even like using the confidence interval, we can say like it's pretty uh, different between these two. But compared to other, for example, here, human resource, look at this, it's a, um, it's, there's a mean is different, but however, with the confidence interval, it's almost like the same. Okay, so this is how you can run the classical words test under the analytics view. However, you don't have to do this every single uh, variable. If we are interested in monthly income, and we have, when you go to the summary view, we have um, a 30 columns and a minus one the monthly income, and we have 29 columns. If you wanna test against, then in that case, you can run this classical words test against all these variables. How are you gonna do it? You go to the correlate, correlation mode, Okay, and in this correlation mode, you can select 
the monthly income as the target variable. Okay. And then we what just happened is it happened, you know, a couple of things happen. Uh, one is to find the correlation, but another one is to run this hypothesis testing, which is this, it says KW test. This is a classical Wallace test. Okay. So what that means is, for example, let's look at that gender here. This classical Wallace test, 0 0.0884, that's the same number that we saw. So it tested uh, this um, difference between female and male. It's precisely is more like a, a particular variance, but the difference between these two is significant in terms of the monthly income. And then because greater than 5%, so you know we can't reject the new hypothesis, but uh, it ran. And then also here in the sort, you can sort by the p-value in this case, and then we can see like a greater the p values here is um, 0 0.98, it's like 98% chance. Like it's so, you know, obviously it, you can't reject. But if you go to the bottom, for example, job level, job role, uh, you know, maybe like a, a age and total working years, these are all less than 0 0.0001, meaning 0 0.01, less than 0.01%. So uh, these are significant. Okay, so we can see, use this summary view to uh, do the, um, this testing instead of like one by one. One thing to note, why we have this like a numerical variables testing again, tested against monthly income. Well, how we do here is that for something like, let's say like an age or total working years, like a, basically we separate, uh, we categorize, uh, create sort of 10 groups based on the underlying numbers. Okay, so for example, like my minimum value is zero to let's say like a max value of 40, and then we divide by 10 with equal widths. It's kind of like a histogram. And each section we calculate the mean. Okay, and then, uh, uh, sorry, we don't have to calculate the mean, but we actually separate into 10 groups, 10 categories, and then run this uh, classical worries test. The behind the, the lo logic is the same. Okay, so that says, basically this KW test is sort of kind of weird, even like against numerical variables, but we create this as a 10 categories and it tests it, just like we saw with the job role in the slides, okay. And then, for example, something like, uh, let's say, like a job level, we have only one, two, three, four, I think five. So you can't divide into 10. So in that case, we're going to keep the original values, one, two, three, four, five. Same thing, for, for example, uh, stock option level, that's also like we have only four levels. So we're going to use that as a four categories, the four groups. Then we run the cross categories test. Okay. So um, I think that's, it for today. Um, <clears throat> so what we have basically covered is what the classical words test is. And then basically we uh, concluded that classical words, words test is kind of like a superman in the hypothesis test because you can use it for you know various uh, scenario. Like it doesn't have to be like a you know uh, explanatory variable uh, have to be like two groups. It can be used for like three or five or whatever, how many groups that could be. And also there's no assumption. So like you don't have to worry about the underlying data distribution. Uh, it can be used for like small data or a big data uh, either way. And because of that particular reason, I'm uh, not particular, because of those reasons, we use classical words test as a default in the summary views correlation mode. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, <clears throat> Um, so our online seminar information of your future or the past recording, always please go to exploited.io. There's a training seminar uh, under the alarm. And then uh, uh, and then like, that's where you can see all sorts of uh, recording and a future schedule. You go to the how to tutorials and video, then you can see like a bunch of uh, notes on how to use you know, particular functionality or run particular analytics in exploratory. Other than that, uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to Khan at exploratory.io. 
And also we have Twitter account, Exploratory Data. So please follow. That's where we announce the new features, introductions, or any product related updates and was announcement of this type of the seminar as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining um, to, to, uh, today's seminar. And I'd like to open a Q&A session.